The following sermon by Jonathan Edwards is called The Heart of Man is Exceedingly Deceitful. It is taken from Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. God is here threatening the destruction of Judah and Jerusalem, and particularly he had, in the verses immediately preceding, denounced a curse against him that trusts in man and makes flesh his arm and declared such blessed as trust in the Lord. And lest any should flatter themselves with hopes of escaping the curse and obtaining the blessing through a wrong opinion of themselves, or an imagination that they by their dissimulation and hypocrisy had deceived God, God puts them in mind of the deceitfulness of the heart, but informs them that however deceitful the heart is, and however difficult it is for men themselves or for other men that are conversant with them to know it, yet he could not be deceived by it. As it follows in the next verse, I, the Lord, search the heart, I try the reins, even to give to every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. There are two things about the heart in the words, its deceitfulness and its wickedness. The latter possibly may be mentioned as that from where its deceitfulness arises. Tis because the heart is so desperately wicked that it is so deceitful. Sin is a very deceitful thing. Thus we read of the deceitfulness of sin, Hebrews 3.13. Or the deceitfulness of the heart may be mentioned as part of its wickedness and hypocrisy. Wickedness and hypocrisy both represent that which is very odious to God. The deceitfulness of the heart is set forth by two expressions, both of them representing of it as exceeding deceitful. Number one, that it is deceitful above all things. And number two, it is set forth by the exceeding difficulty of knowing it. Doctrine. What I now propose from these words is to show that the heart of man is exceeding deceitful. The deceitfulness of the heart is twofold, its treacherousness and hypocrisy towards others, and its being so full of deceit towards itself. It's very deceitful in that it is exceeding prone to treacherousness and hypocrisy towards others, both towards God and towards men. The deceitfulness of the heart towards God consists in its being full of dissimulation with respect to what now is in the heart and in its being most treacherous towards God as to pretenses and promises of what is future. Indeed, there is no such thing as the heart's being deceitful towards God as to any tendency to actual deceiving of God or any difficulty there is on God's part to know the heart. God never was deceived with any heart or about anything that there is in the heart nor is he put to any difficulty to discern what is in the heart. It is all open to the view of God. He perfectly sees and knows everything that is in it. Yet there is a proneness in the heart to be doing what in it lies to deceive God. If God is not deceived, the cause of it is not on the part of the heart, because that doesn't have a disposition to deceive him. Therefore, number one, the heart is full of dissimulation and hypocrisy towards God. Although men are told that God knows everything, is that nothing can be hid from him. Yet men are exceeding prone to be dissembling before God, and make pretenses to him of that which is not. They make a show of this and that in their hearts, which is not in them, and which is directly contrary to what is in them. Men are very apt to dissemble in their prayers, and not only in their prayers and why I see them, but the eye of God. They are very ready to make an appearance and pretense before God, as though they were very sensible that they were great sinners, and that sin was a vile thing and a thing that deserved God's wrath. They will confess before God and would be taken as though they spoke from their hearts that they are sinners, that they come sinful into the world and that their hearts are full of sin, and that they have nothing that is good in them, and that the best that they can do is sinful when they are not sensible of any such thing. They are not sensible that they have got hearts as they tell of. They never were convinced that they were so vile and wicked, nor are not convinced of it then at the very time they confess it. When they say they have no good in them, they really don't believe it. They at the same time secretly entertain an opinion as though they had a great deal that is good in them. 
They have a very good opinion of themselves. They have a high opinion of their own righteousness. They will say to God that they don't deserve any mercy at God's hands, but yet they don't believe what they say themselves. They all the while entertain an opinion that they do deserve something, and they expect that God should have respect to their efforts too. And if he doesn't, they'll quarrel with God and have blasphemous thoughts of him. At the same time that they confess that their prayers are good for nothing, and that he may cast them as dung in their faces, they yet think in their hearts that God should have respect to their prayers. They think that God's heart should be drawn to them by such good, affectionate, and earnest prayers as theirs, and will find fault with God if it isn't so. They will reckon that God deals hardly by them if he has no respect to their religion. They'll confess before God that they deserve hell, that God would deal justly by them if he should cast them without mercy into hell. But at the same time, they don't think any such thing. They never were convinced that God would deal justly by them and that they should have no reason to find fault if he should cast them into hell. They seem to be mighty humble in their prayers and will confess what poor, unworthy, miserable nothings they are and all the while have no spark of humility in them, but a spirit of horrid pride is reigning in them. They make gods of themselves. They set up themselves in God's room and are full of self-exalting thoughts and are self-dependent and self-sufficient and trust in their own righteousness and their own wisdom and strength. They pretend as though they had a great mind to be kept from sin. They will pray to God to keep them from sin to assist and strengthen them against temptations, and yet all the while never intend seriously to endeavor. They go away from their prayers and live as bad as they did before. They plainly show that they have no great mind to be kept from sin. They pray that God would help them against Satan's temptations, but don't strive against them. When Satan tempts them, they easily yield to his suggestions. They pray that God would keep them and that he would watch over them as though they had a great mind to be kept from sin, but don't watch over themselves, are senseless about themselves. So they make a show in their prayers as though they had a dependence on God for all their good things. They pray to him for this and the other blessing as though they expect it all from him and him alone, when indeed it is not so. They are not convinced that God is the author of all blessings nor do they trust a matter with him, as appears by their excessive anxiety about getting this and the other enjoyment themselves and their irregular methods of pursuing of them. They neglect their duty to God for the sake of worldly enjoyments, which shows that they do not have their dependence on God for them. So they'll make pretenses as though they were sensible of God's infinite power and holiness and sufficiency. They'll say to God in their prayers that he is able to do all things for them and he has enough to supply all their wants and that he is a God of infinite mercy when all the while they really don't believe those things. There is a world of hypocrisy and dissimulation in men's prayers and even in their secret prayers. And not only in the prayers of wicked men but there is much of it in the prayers even of the godly. The hearts of all men in this world, as they have abundance of wickedness, so they have abundance of hypocrisy and deceitfulness. And as men are full of dissimulation and self-pretenses towards God in their prayers, so in the other things. And their attendance on ordinances and in all transactions in which they have to do with God, they do what in them lies to deceive God and make him think them much better than they are in truth. They are hypocritical and deceitful in their behavior as well as in their prayers. They make an outward show of devotion and respect to God and religion and would have God take it as being truly a manifestation of a devout and good spirit when indeed they have no true respect to God. They don't have one spark of love to him but their hearts are full of hatred towards him. Number two, their heart is exceedingly deceitful. It is very treacherous towards God and false in his covenant, most false to promises and engagements. This is called deceitfulness in scripture, Psalm seventy-eight, fifty-six, and 57. 
Yet they tempted and provoked the Most High God, and kept not his testimonies, but turned back and dealt unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow. And again in Hosea 7, verse 16, They return, but not to the Most High. They are like a deceitful bow. For although God's not really deceived when men's hearts are treacherous, and they are false to their promises, yet God, speaking of himself after the manner of men, speaks as though he expected that they should behave as they promise and engage, but they fail him. God looks for grapes, but behold, they bring forth wild grapes. The visible people of God, they all make profession of serving God, of giving up themselves to him, and giving their consent to his covenant, that they will be for him and for no other. But few are there that walk according to such a fashion, and those that do more explicitly engage to be the Lord's and come under vows oftentimes prove very deceitful. They don't do as they promise. How many are there that own the covenant and promise in a solemn manner that they will live in a way of obedience to all God's commands as long as they live, that are not careful to fulfill their engagements, and they come to the sacrament and from time to time renew and seal these vows, but it is done deceitfully. They are very unfaithful in God's covenant. This is what is called swearing deceitfully. Psalm 24, verse 4. He that has clean hands and a pure heart, that is not lifted up a soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. The heart of man is very deceitful in that it is very unstable. Men will begin sometimes in a way of religion and make promises as though they would walk in a way of religion and would no more live in such or such a way of sin, but they soon change their minds. They return as a dog to his own vomit. Men oftentimes in distress and especially on a sick bed will make many promises how they will live if God will raise them up again, but there is no trusting to them. They are so false and deceitful. If they are raised up and restored to health, they neglect their souls and are as careless about their duty as they used to be. This shows the desperate wickedness and deceitfulness of the heart. Thus the heart is full of hypocrisy and unfaithfulness towards God. Secondly, it is also so towards men, and in the same respects as towards God. Number one, there is a disposition in the heart of man to deceive others with false shows and pretenses. First, there is a disposition to pretend that they are much better than they really are. Though men love their own wickedness and will indulge it secretly, yet men have that natural conscience which tells them that it is shameful and it is a thing of ill repute. Men therefore generally disguise themselves. There are but few that are indeed as they appear in the world amongst men. They'll cover over their wickedness, and will it may be seem to show a hatred of this and that other wickedness which they all the while secretly practice themselves. They seem to have a zeal against sins and others that they secretly allow themselves in. Romans 2 verse 1 Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doing things. Men will seem to be very zealous sometimes against lasciviousness and against drunkenness and others that all the while are sinful carnal wretches themselves. So it is a common thing for persons to seem to have a very hot zeal against pride in others, whereas they are very proud themselves, and that is the very thing that makes them have such a zeal against it in others. Proud men can't bear that others should be proud. Oftentimes men will do things from an ill disposition and an ill end and pretend to others that they do it from a very good spirit. Sometimes they'll pretend that they do such and such a thing from respect to the public good when really it is nothing but their private interest that they aim at. They are wholly influenced and governed by private views. They pretend that they are governed by some good spirit when they are only influenced by their envy and their malice and revenge. They have a peak against some of their neighbors, and they christen it with the name of conscience and public spirit and Christian zeal and many sanctified names. So men will pretend before others to a great deal more goodness than they have. Proverbs 20, verse 6. 
Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. In places where saintship is in reputation, there are many that appear saints before men that are far enough from it in the dark. There are many that love to put on a saint-like appearance amongst others that will be forward to talk about religion and to tell of their experiences and appear forward in religion that are gross hypocrites. The eye of man is more regarded by many than the eye of God, so it was of old, Matthew 23, verse 5. But all their works they do to be seen of men. Number 2. Again, there is a proneness in the heart of man to be very deceitful in making pretenses of friendship and goodwill to their neighbor. Men, when they are with others and before their faces, are apt to make an appearance as though they had no ill will to them, as though they had a good respect to them. They won't talk against them, but seem to show a good esteem. But when they are behind their backs, it is quite otherwise. They give themselves a liberty then to run out against them to deride them. They'll sit down and talk against him, it may be, for half an hour together and seem to do it with great delight. They are mightily entertained by such kind of talk. All the while they seem so fair to their faces, mischief is in their hearts. They wish them ill. They would be glad to have some mischief befall him. They would be glad if he met with something to lessen his prosperity. Psalm 28, verse 3. Draw me not away with the wicked and with the workers of iniquity, which speak peace to their neighbors, but mischief is in their hearts. In Psalm 12, verse 2, they speak vanity, every one with his neighbor, with flattering lips, and with a double heart do they speak. Such double hearts are deceitful hearts. To the same purpose, Psalm 55, verse 21, the words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet were they drawn swords. And though they seem so friendly for the manner of their behavior before their faces, yet when they are behind their backs, they'll be working to do them a mischief. Jeremiah 9 verse 4 Take ye heed every one of his neighbor, and trust ye not in any brother. For every brother will utterly supplant, and every neighbor will walk with slanders. And in the eighth verse, their tongue is an arrow shot out. It speaketh deceit. One speaketh peaceably to his neighbor with his mouth, but in his heart he layeth in wait. There is a proneness in the heart to unfaithfulness towards men. There are but few men that one may thoroughly depend upon. Proverbs 20, verse 6, A faithful man who can find. Men are more ready to make promises and give fair words, and they be strict to fulfill their engagements. The heart of man is a false heart and a treacherous heart, both towards God and men. But few men are so exact and punctual in fulfilling what they have given others reason to expect from them, as they ought to be. And multitudes are exceedingly otherwise. They are so deceitful that none can tell what to expect from what they say. Thus we have shown how the heart is deceitful in its hypocrisy, falseness, and treachery towards others. I shall leave the consideration of its being full of deceit towards itself for the application with another opportunity. Application I shall conclude with a few improvements of what has been said. Number one. From what has been said, we may learn how unreasonable it is that many men depend upon their religion and practical worship to recommend them to God. Those that are most full of hypocrisy, dissembling and deceitfulness in their prayers and outward worship, are generally those that have the greatest dependence on their religion. They think that God has and ought to have a great respect to them because of their religion. When they have only been provoking God with hypocrisy and lying, they flatter him with their mouth and lie to him with their tongues as the children of Israel, Psalm 78, 36. They foolishly flatter themselves that because they have confessed that they were very sinful creatures, and that they deserved hell, and could challenge no mercy, that therefore God will be disposed to pity them and forgive their sin. Though they did it in hypocrisy, and are not really convinced of their vileness and desert of hell, though they confessed it. 
They think that because they said in their prayers that God was an infinitely holy and merciful God, and that his grace was wonderful to poor sinners and sending the Son to die and the like, they think God likes them much the better for their committing of him so when it was nothing but flattery. They don't believe in their hearts that God is an infinitely gracious God and an infinitely merciful God. Such kind of prayers as these are those that men commonly trust to and make a righteousness of, are and well may be very worthless things in the sight of God. They set much by them, but God sets nothing by them. God knows the heart. He understands the difference between the pretenses and the reality, and he has no pleasure in such flattering and hypocrisy. He knows that for all their prayers and their confessions and flattering, that they hate him in their hearts, their souls loathe and abhor him. God knows that after all their pretenses, that it would be a thing no way disagreeable to them if there were no God. And if his being were not continued, it would be no ill tidings if it were possible. If they should hear that he was divested of his dominion and government and were dethroned, and how far then may we conclude God is from delighting in their prayers or having his heart drawn by them? The second application is for examination. Let this doctrine be put every man upon examining himself, whether he is not thus hypocritical and unfaithful towards God and men. It is a thing that men's own consciences are better capable of determining whether or not they are deceitful towards others than whether they deceive themselves. When men deceive others, they may know it, but when they deceive themselves, they don't know it. Examine how it is in your prayers. Are you not guilty of great dissimulation in your confessions and in your praises and thanksgivings? If you are so, it is good you should be sensible of it and reflect upon it. Recollect how it has been in time past and consider how it is now. When you come before God in prayer, you make a show of something. There is a show of humility and often of a sense of God's greatness and glory and a show of a sense of God's mercy and of a sense of his undeserved kindness towards you. Is it anything else but a show? Or does the reality or what really is to be found in your heart in any measure answerable to the pretense? There are many amongst us that make a show of goodness before God and men. Be strict in examining what agreement there is between the appearance and the heart. And examine whether or not you don't sometimes call base dispositions by good names. Don't you pretend sometimes and would have it taken that you do things for a good end and out of conscience and from respect to your duty and to the common good when you only prize at your own interest and are governed by some base spirit towards your neighbors? And are you not guilty of appearing fair to men's faces? And are you a faithful man or are you one that there is no trusting to? Are you not unfaithful to your engagements to God and man? You have promised many of you expressly that you are faithful. Are you not like a deceitful bow that deceives the archer and frustrates his aim by carrying wide from the mark? Number three. If there be so great a proneness in the heart to be deceitful towards others and watch and strive against it, it is odious to God. It is unbecoming Christians who should be sincere and without hypocrisy as it is said of the wisdom that is from above, James 3, verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. It is a character that Christ gives of Nathanael that he is an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. John 1, verse 47. Simplicity is spoken of as a Christian grace. Romans 12, verse 8, and 2 Corinthians 1, 12. The Apostle tells us that in simplicity and godly sincerity we have had our conversation in the world. The heart is so deceitful, so apt to fall into these deceitful ways, there is need of great watchfulness. When you are in God's presence, keep that in mind, that God knows exactly what is in your heart. How much, how agreeable to your words, in all your transactions with God, remember this. It was proposed from the words to show that the heart of man is exceeding deceitful. 
The deceitfulness of the heart is twofold. Number one, the proneness of the heart to falseness and deceitfulness towards others. And number two, it's being full of deceit towards itself. Part two, the heart is full of deceit towards itself. The heart of man is so deceitful that it is not only prone to deceive others, but it is exceeding apt to be deluded by itself. This proneness to delusion about itself may very well be called the deceitfulness of the heart. For the deceit or delusion belongs to the heart three ways. The heart is deceived from itself. There is that notion and disposition in the heart that leads it astray and tends to even blinding and delusion. And this delusion is also in itself. It is the heart that deceives. So it is the same heart that is deceived and then the deceit is about itself. The succeeding proneness of the heart to deceive itself or be deceived about itself appears in the following things first. The heart is exceeding prone to delusions and deceit about its own knowledge. It is not apt to be sensible of its own ignorance. Men are exceedingly ready to entertain high thoughts of their own knowledge. Job 11 verse 12 for vain man would be wise, though man be born like a wild ass's colt. Though man be a poor, inferior creature who comes into the world after the same manner as the creatures, dwells in a house of clay, and has his understanding clogged and clouded with flesh, yet he will needs conceit himself wise, and is very ready to have a vast conceit of his own understanding. Man's being so apt to be deceived in this point may be reckoned as a part of the deceitfulness of the heart. Knowledge and understanding is very commonly attributed to the heart in Scripture, though sometimes by the heart it seems more especially to be understood as a will and affections. And the root and spring of this deceit lies partly in the heart or in the depravity of the will and affections, though it partly is from the defect of the understanding. It is from man's ignorance, or because of their exceeding ignorance, that they are not sensible of their own ignorance, and that they so foolishly conceit that they know so much. It is because they are very blind that they are so conceited of their own sharp-sightedness. Men don't know enough to know their own ignorance, and the wiser men truly are, the more would they be sensible of their own ignorance. 1 Corinthians 8 verse 2 if any man thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. Here, number one, men are very apt to be deceived about the extent of their faculties. They are very prone to think that they extend to things that they do not extend to. Men are ready to have such an opinion of their own power that they think nothing too high for their reach, nothing too big for them to grasp. They are scarcely willing to allow anything that is true to be above their comprehension and therefore are very ready to question the truth of things that are so. Man's proud, self-conceited heart can hardly allow of mysteries that are unintelligible by them, and therefore things that are puzzling and confounding to their minds, they don't know how to allow to be true, and that even in divine things are things pertaining to the nature and ways of God. Man has such a proud thought of his own faculties that he hardly will allow God himself to be above his reach, and is ready to look upon it as strange that there should be anything belonging to God that is true and yet be inconceivable by their own understandings. And therefore men are ready to call in question the truth of the revelations which God has made of himself, because there are some things in that revelation that are above them. There are many difficulties in the scripture that to them are insuperable, and therefore they are ready to question the truth of the scriptures. God reveals in his word that there are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and that these are all the very same God. This doctrine has been a great trial of men. There have been many that have expressly and openly denied it only for this reason, because they could not understand it. There are some that say that this doctrine is an insult to human reason. The thing is, they have such a conceit of the extent of human wisdom that they are too proud to swallow anything merely upon a testimony of God unless they can see other reasons besides his testimony. And so how difficultly do men entertain those doctrines of God's absolute decrees, especially of election and reprobation? Men can't understand how these doctrines can be consistent with justice, and therefore many in the world professedly deny any such things. 
and others that because they have been taught this doctrine from their infancy don't deny it, yet are very apt secretly to doubt of the truth of it. Or if they allow it to be true, they won't allow it to be just. They are ready to charge God with injustice and cruelty. It arises from a deceived notion that men have about their own understandings. They are ready to set up their own reason upon a level with the wisdom of God. If they knew what poor, dark, feeble, narrow things their own understandings were, the great mysteriousness of those things would be no obstacle to their receiving them and acquiescing in them upon divine testimony. It would not seem strange to them that there should be many things in God far above their comprehensions. They would see that it might as well be expected that a nutshell should contain the acorn as that their understanding should comprehend God or his ways. If men were sensible how short-sighted and dim-sighted their souls were, it would be no obstacle to their believing that God has eternally decreed all things, and absolutely decreed who shall be saved, and to believe that God is just and righteous, because he can't see how it can be, but through a vast deceit about his own faculties, men are ready to say to God, What doest thou? as though they understood how he should do better than he himself. This is the cause of much of the unbelief that is in the world, that men are so deceived about their own understandings. This was the occasion of the unbelief of many in Christ's time. The Jews could not swallow the mysteries of the kingdom. When Christ told them that except they eat his flesh and drink his blood, they had no life in them, they say, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Many of them that used to follow him upon this left him and went no more with him. When the psalmist was stumbled and almost overthrown by the mysteriousness of God's ways, he acknowledged afterwards it was from his folly and ignorance. Psalm 73 verse 22 So foolish are men to be deceived about their own faculties and understandings. Number 2 As men are very apt to be deceived about their faculties, as to the extent of them, so they are very apt to be deceived about their liableness to mistake. Men are commonly deceived about the strengths of their own reason and of the goodness of their own judgments. They are not sensible how apt they are to be misled by prejudice and to be deceived by false colors and by a partial understanding of things. Man is a creature exceedingly liable to err if left to himself, and that in matters of the greatest moment. But it is a difficult thing to make men sensible of it as to themselves. They are ready enough to be sensible that others are liable to mistake, but not of their own. Indeed, it is impossible but that men should think that they are in the right in particular judgments they make. But this doesn't hinder but that men might carry along with them a general sense of that proneness to err which yet but a few do. And therefore it is that men are so sudden and rash in the judgments which they pass upon things, and this is the reason that men are so confident in many judgments they make. They are very dogmatical and positive in their opinions, and it may be in things in which they are peculiar. They look to their own understanding. And this is the reason that many men, when they once drink in an ocean, nothing will beat them off from it. They'll hearken to no reason that can be offered to convince them that they are in error. They make light of the judgment of other folks and think them ridiculous. They despise the reasons that they offer. When once they have set down their foot, there is no moving them. If men were sensible what very fallible things they are, they would always be open to receive, to hearken to what be offered on the other side, to consider and weigh it impartially. And in many judgments they pass, they would not be so positive. And men would be more cautious how they made and passed their judgments. They would wait till they saw good reason before they fixed. If men were sensible of their own liableness to mistake, they would be more disposed to pray to God for his guidance and illumination, that they might be directed to the truth. Like the psalmist in Psalm 25, verses 4 and 5, Show me thy ways, O Lord, teach me thy paths. Number three, men are exceeding apt to be deceived about their own actual knowledge when compared with the knowledge of others. Men are very ready to set themselves very high in their esteem of the knowledge they have obtained. 
They are ready to imagine themselves to be much wiser than many of their neighbors that are as wise, and it may be wiser than they. Proverbs 26, verse 16. The fool is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. And this is a reason that many men won't hearken to instructions and counsels of others. They are too wise to be taught. So men are prone to deceit about their own knowledge compared with the knowledge of God. They are not sensible how much wiser God is than they, and therefore won't hearken to God's counsels. They choose to be led by their own wisdom. They think they know what is best for themselves and will choose that which seems best to them rather than what God says is best for them. Number four, and lastly, men are very apt to be deceived about their spiritual blindness. They are not sensible how blind they are and unable of themselves to obtain the spiritual knowledge of divine things. It is a hard thing to persuade men, but that they don't have ability within themselves to see and understand the glory of God and the excellency of Jesus Christ and the certain truth of the gospel. They have no eyes to see, but they are not sensible of it. They are ready to imagine that they can see. They hope to bring themselves to it. Man is naturally perfectly blind to spiritual things. They have no more eyes to see the glory of divine things, and a man born blind has eyes to see light and colors, but yet how few are there that are truly convinced of it. And men are apt to be deceived and to think that not only that they can understand spiritual things, but also that they actually do understand the glory of God and Christ when they do, but more of this under another head. Secondly, the heart of man is exceeding apt to be deceived about its own natural corruption and wickedness. The heart of man naturally is exceeding full of wickedness. It is desperately wicked, as it is said in the verse of the text. Men are a generation of vipers. Matthew 3, verse 7, O generation of vipers. The poison of the wicked is as a poison of a serpent. Psalm 58, verse 4. But men are very inept to be sensible of it. They don't think themselves so vile and wicked. They don't see any such fountain of corruption in their hearts, and they deceive themselves about it in these following respects. Number one, they have many principles of corruption in their hearts that they don't think to be there. All men have all manner of wickedness in their hearts. There is no lust that the heart is without, no kind of wickedness, but there is a seed of it. There are a great many strands of wickedness that men don't imagine that they have any principle in them that leads to it. Their wickedness has been restrained from breaking out as it is done in some others and they think it is not there. They hear of those sins of others and they think there is no such wickedness in them. Men oftentimes themselves are left to commit such wickedness that they didn't think had been in them to commit. They thought they hated such practices which they themselves afterwards are guilty of. When Elisha told Haziel of the evil that he should do to the children of Israel, that he would set their strongholds on fire and kill their young men with the sword and dash their children and rip up their women with child, Haziel did not believe that it was in him. He replied, What is thy servant a dog that he should do this thing? Second Kings 8 verse 13. But yet afterwards he did it. Oftentimes natural men are not sensible that they hate God. They don't see that they have such a principle of enmity against him, when indeed they have the same kind of hearts towards God as the devil has. And if God should leave them to themselves and restraint should be taken off, they would break out in blasphemy and would appear as God's avowed enemies. The Jews in Christ's time were not sensible that they had any hatred to God. They thought they loved him, made a great show. But it was evident that they hated him because they hated Christ, the Son of God. John 15, verse 23. He that hateth me hateth my father also. The Jews that built the sepulchres of the prophets whom their fathers killed, they did not imagine they had the same persecuting, cruel principle in their heart. They said if we lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Matthew 23, verse 30. But they had the same spirit in them, and were guilty of the same practice, and to a far worse degree. For their fathers persecuted the prophets, but the Jews cruelly and maliciously killed the Son of God. They did much worse than their fathers. 
So many wicked men in these days may be ready to wonder at the Jews that they should do as they did in killing Christ, and that if they had lived in those days they should not have done so, but they have the very same hearts. The papists now are exceeding superstitious in their pretenses of respect to Christ, in garnishing Christ's sepulchre and attending the memorials of his death, but they have the same hearts as the Jews who crucified Christ. Men know not what is in their hearts till God teaches them. Number two, men are very difficultly made sensible how great and strong the lust of their hearts are and how much their hearts are under the power of them. Natural men are wholly under the dominion of sin, but are very inept to be sensible of it. They have nothing that is good in them. They are ready to think that they have many good things, but they are not able to perform one good action, and that they are not sensible of it. They can never, through their strength, bring themselves to put forth one gracious act, but natural men are apt to be endeavoring of it in their own strength. Wicked men may be sensible that they have wickedness, but they are hardly made sensible how great their wickedness and how much they are under the dominion of it. They don't believe now, but they are ready to think that if they have seen Christ work those miracles that are reported of him, they should believe. But they have the same principle of unbelief that the Jews had, and are as much under the power of it as they that did see those miracles. They don't believe now, but they think if they should see and talk with one that rose from the dead and come from another world, they should believe. But what says Abraham in the parable, Luke 16, verse 31? If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So men are not easily made sensible what disobedient and rebellious hearts they have. The children of Israel were deceived about their own hearts at Mount Sinai when Moses rehearsed the words of the law in the ears of the people. They say upon it, All that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient, Exodus 24, 7. But what did God say concerning them and concerning what they had said? We may see an account in Moses' rehearsal of it to the people, Deuteronomy 5, 27 and 29. Go thou near and hear all that the Lord our God shall say, and speak thou unto us all that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee, and we will hear it and do it. And the Lord heard the voice of your words when you spake unto me, and the Lord said unto me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people which they have spoken unto thee. They have well said all that they have spoken. Oh, that there were such an heart in them, that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. So again, the people were very much deceived about their own hearts after they came to Canaan. See Joshua 24, verse 14, and so on. And even the godly are very prone to be deceived in this matter, not to be sensible how great the remainder of corruption in their hearts are. God sometimes leaves them that they may know what is in their hearts. So it is said of Hezekiah that God left him to try him, that he might know all that was in his heart. Second Chronicles 32, verse 31. Peter was not sensible what was in his heart when upon Christ saying to his disciples that all of them should be offended because of him that night, he answered, Though all men should be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. And when told that he should deny Christ, he said, Though I should die with thee, yet I will not deny thee. Young converts especially oftentimes are insensible how great the remainders of sin are in them while they are affected with their first discoveries. They have their minds very much taken up about spiritual things, and it seems to them that they are quite weaned from the world, but they don't imagine what a worldly spirit there is that yet remains. While they are in their first gracious affections, they wonder it may be that others should be so proud, that they should be so contentious, and that they should so much have a spirit of ill will towards their neighbors. They don't imagine what a dreadful pride and what a spirit of malice and envy and revenge yet lurks in their own hearts. Number three. Men are very prone to be deceived to think that the things which are ill principles in their hearts are not so. Tis a common thing that men have many habits and dispositions that are prevalent in their hearts that are very ill, and that appear ill to others. 
that ye don't appear ill to them. They think them to be lawful in no way to be condemned. They will plead for them as lawful in their own thoughts, to their own consciences, and sometimes put evil for good and good for evil, darkness for light and light for darkness. Men are apt to do thus even about the worst dispositions. They are under the prevalency of a disposition that others call pride, and that is indeed so, but they think it is not pride, but account it only a suitable and regular regard to their own just and due honor. They are under the prevalency of envious spirit, but they don't think it is envy, so they are under the prevalency of revenge, but they account it no more than just resentment of the injuries they have suffered. They are of a very covetous spirit, which makes them excessively anxious about their worldly profit and exceeding saving. But they think tis no more than a prudent care to provide for themselves and families, and a becoming frugality to save their estates. Or it may be they are under the prevalency of a sensual disposition, but they judge that it is no more than the regular exercise of the natural appetite that belongs to human nature. The heart is desperately deceitful in those things. The world is full of such kind of deceit as this is. Men do not esteem those things vicious in them that are mere wickedness, and such things that justly make them odious in the sight of God and man. As if men are convinced so far that their dispositions are something plain worthy, yet they are greatly deceived as to the degree of the badness of those dispositions. Thirdly, the heart is deceitful about its own acts. It is deceitful about the agreement of their actions as to the matter of them with the rule. Men will strain rules, rest them, use false interpretations. They will do anything with rules to make their actions and rules to suit. They will ignore rules of natural justice, rules of God's word. Even the plainest rules won't hold men, such as do by others as they would have them do by them. The principles and ends of their actions should be from a gracious respect to God, love to their neighbors, and they should do such a thing for God's glory. They are mistaken as to the degree of influence the different ends have. Application Number one, don't trust your own heart. Labor to get a sense of the deceitfulness of your heart. When you find yourself ready to entertain a high thought of your own wisdom and knowledge, consider how prone the heart of man is to be deceived in this matter. And when you find yourself ready to doubt of the mysteries that are revealed in God's word, i.e. the Trinity, God's decrees, consider how unreasonable it is to imagine that there should be nothing in God or in his ways above your knowledge. Consider that it may be your doubting all the while is only from a foolish, deceived conceitedness of your own wisdom and understanding. And when you take up any opinion and are ready to wax positive, if you would do the part of a wise man, maintain a jealous eye over your own heart and endeavor to keep it in exercise in a sense of your own liableness to mistake how that man is to be positive. And don't in a foolish self-confidence shut your eyes against light. Be open always to conviction of a mistake. Be ready to receive counsel and learn the truth from anyone. In a sense of your own darkness and exceeding fallibility and distrusting your own wisdom, seek to God to lead and instruct you. Proverbs 3 verse 5 Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. Don't trust your own heart with respect to the apprehension you are ready to have of your own dispositions or actions. When you appear amiable in your own sight and are ready to plead for and excuse these and those things in yourself, still let the thought be present with you that persons are exceeding apt to be deceived in such manners and that there is no reason to think that your heart is not prone to err this way as well as others. Maintain a jealousy and suspicion of yourself when you are pursuing the world and carrying and laboring to enrich yourself, lest you should serve the lust of covetousness and an inordinate thirst after earthly things and not know it. And don't trust your own heart in any contention or difference that may be between you and your neighbor, 
but be jealous of it and watch it narrowly, lest you should give way to malice and be deceived about it and think it something else. Be always at such times upon the search and be ready to listen to searching sermons. If you have a distrust of your own heart, as it becomes you to have, you will be glad to be searched, lest you should mistake evil for good and good for evil, and put darkness for light and light for darkness. And don't trust to the stability of your own heart. It is a very foolish thing so to do. Proverbs 28, verse 26, He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. Don't put off anything that your hand finds to do. Trust into your own purposes and resolutions of what you will do hereafter. The best way, if you would be upon any certainty about the manner, is immediately to set about it and do it with your might. And when you have drawn up resolutions, teach your heart to keep a guard lest you lose them. And don't trust your own heart in the judgment which you make of your own state, but remember how often persons are deceived. Here, to enforce this advice of not trust in your own heart, I will desire you to consider how dangerous this deceit of the heart is. Being deceived about your own knowledge is a foundation of unbelief, blasphemy, and refusing counsel, and is an obstacle to divine light. Christ came that those that see not might see, and that those that see might be made blind. John 9, verse 39. It is a necessity that men may be sensible of their own blindness. Men must become fools that they may be wise. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 19 So in the deceitfulness of the heart about natural corruption, it is of necessity that men see that they are deceived by their own hearts and about actions. There is a woe denounced against them that call evil good. Isaiah 5 verse 20 Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. It is a fatal thing to trust to the constancy of the heart. Many thousands have this way perished. So it is a very fatal thing for men to imagine themselves to be something when they are nothing. Such men are never like to be converted. Galatians 6 verse 3 If any man think himself something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. That is, he elevates himself, he promotes himself to heaven, but is never like to obtaining, but takes an effectual course to prevent his going to heaven, so that he deludes his own soul. Men, by the deceitfulness of their own hearts, they are caught like a bird in the snare of the fowler, and they catch and ensnare themselves. Their hearts cheat and ensnare them. Their souls are the bird that is caught. And they themselves are the fowler that spreads the snare. If you trust your own heart, your own heart will deceive you, and your own heart will undo you. Job 15 verse 31 Let not him that is deceived trust in vanity, for vanity shall be his recompense. The second use is particularly to exhort you to take the greatest care that you be not deceived about your condition. Consider that besides the deceitfulness of your own hearts, there is a devil that with all his craft and subtlety labors to deceive you. He is the most subtle deceiver that ever was. I conclude with some directions to you that you may avoid being deceived about the condition of your souls. Number 1. Be exceedingly careful how you first establish a hope. You that have not as yet established one, Persons are ready suddenly to drop a conclusion that they are converted when they have experienced anything remarkable, or if they tell their experiences and they perceive that others have hopes of them, they at once conclude they are in the right and settle it that it is certainly so that they have passed from death to life. This is a matter that ought to be determined with the utmost caution, for when once men have embraced such an opinion of themselves, that they are converted is an exceedingly difficult thing for them to lay it down again. There are scarcely any two things more difficultly parted than the hypocrite and his hope. If men throw it by for a little while, they'll take it up again. In some, it may be when old, it will be a vast disadvantage. 
Ordinarily, I would advise not to settle in hope merely from the experience of a few minutes or an hour, but to wait till it be found that there is an habitual change, a change of nature and heart that appears in a course of experiences and acts. If this method were taken, it is probable there would be fewer persons deceived with common illuminations and transient affections. It is advisable, therefore, for persons not fully to depend upon their experience, though there be a fair appearance and it looks very hopeful, nor fully to establish and hope from the judgment of others till they have themselves thoroughly searched and examined their own hearts by the rules of God's word. Number three, ordinarily it is best never to leave searching your own hearts, regardless of what appearances soever you have, though you think you have had a very clear work and great discoveries. Self-examination and caution in this manner are duties that belong to all Christians, ordinarily as long as they live. The great saints that we read of in scripture have used it. The psalmist, he begged of God once and again that he would search him and prove him. The Apostle Paul used caution and care, lest after he had preached to others, he himself should be a castaway, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27. If persons make this a duty of their lives, and using prayer with it, that God would search them and make known their state to them, it is the likeliest way. Those that are always praying and searching, they are much more likely sometime or other to have the true state of their souls discovered to them and if they are upon a wrong foundation to have it discovered to them. God will probably at some time or other let in the light. If you are confident, yet it is best to search your souls. Many hypocrites are very confident. And if you have true assurance, this will be the way to have it more confidently and fixedly. Number four. Never to leave off seeking grace. If you have obtained grace, yet seek it as earnestly as though you had not obtained it. The Apostle Paul, though so great a saint, did so, and he did so for this end, that he might be sure of obtaining eternal life, that he might be found in Christ not having his own righteousness, that he might know him and the power of his resurrection, and that by any means he might obtain the resurrection of the dead. Philippians 3 verse 8. That is one principal reason why being deceived in this manner is so fatal, that when persons think themselves already converted and upon false grounds, it is commonly this influence upon them to make them leave off seeking grace. A Sermon on the Deceitfulness of the Heart by Jonathan Edwards, dated before 1733. Stillwater's Revival Books is now located at PuritanDownloads.com. It's your worldwide online Reformation home for the very best in free and discounted classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, MP3s, and videos. For much more information on the Puritans and Reformers, including the best free and discounted classic and contemporary books, MP3s, digital downloads, and videos, please visit Stillwater's Revival Books at PuritanDownloads.com. Stillwater's Revival Books also publishes the Puritan Hard Drive, the most powerful and practical Christian study tool ever produced. All thanks and glory be to the mercy, grace, and love of the Lord Jesus Christ for this remarkable and wonderful new Christian study tool. The Puritan Hard Drive contains over 12,500 of the best Reformation books, MP3s, and videos ever gathered onto one portable Christian study tool. An extraordinary collection of Puritan, Protestant, Calvinistic, Presbyterian, Covenanter, and Reformed Baptist resources. It's fully upgradable and it's small enough to fit in your pocket. The Puritan hard drive combines an embedded database containing many millions of records with the most amazing and extraordinary custom Christian search and research software ever created. The Puritan hard drive has been produced to assist you in the fascinating and exhilarating spiritual, intellectual, familial, ecclesiastical, and societal adventure that is living the Christian life. It has been specifically designed so that you might more faithfully know, serve, and love the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as to help you to do all you can to bring glory to His great name. If you want to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, then the Puritan hard drive is for you. 
Visit PuritanDownloads.com today for much more information on the Puritan hard drive and to take advantage of all the free and discounted Reformation and Puritan books, MP3s, and videos that we offer at Stillwater's Revival Books.